Um, hello, everybody. Good evening or good morning or good day, depending on where you're logging in from. Um, and welcome to tonight's event, our virtual panel focused on the publication More Than Parcels. My name is Christine Schmidt, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to the next event in our series that amplifies themes in our newest exhibition, Holocaust Letters which was launched a couple of weeks ago. I'll put a link in the chat uh, for more information about uh, this uh, exhibition and other events in the series. Tonight's event focuses on the volume More Than Parcels, which was published uh, last year and edited by Jan Lanicek and Jan Lamberts. Um, and it explores the horrors of the Holocaust by focusing on the systematic starvation of Jewish civilians confined to Nazi ghettos and camps. The modest relief parcel, often weighing no more than a few pounds and containing, containing food, medicine, and clothing, could extend the lives and health of prisoners. For Jews in occupied Europe, receiving packages simultaneously provided critical emotional sustenance in the face of despair and grief. Placing these parcels front and center in a history of World War II challenges several myths about Nazi rule and allied responses. Themes and research in this collection have very much helped inform the curation of the Holocaust Letters exhibition. So we thought it would be, of course, very fitting to host this panel with the editors and contributors during uh, the exhibition's run. Now, the Holocaust Letters exhibition and events are co-organized by the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership, or HGRP for short. The HGRP is a collaboration between the Wiener Holocaust Library and the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London. And its primary mission is to reframe public engagement, education, and heritage practice about the history and memory of the Holocaust and genocide. Our activities are partly funded by the Ernest Hecht Charitable Foundation, to whom we are extremely grateful. The Holocaust Letters exhibition examines Holocaust era correspondence for evidence of how Jewish persecutees understood what was happening to them as events of the Holocaust unfolded. Through letters held in the library's archive and in private collections, the exhibition uncovers how people exchanged information across borders in defiance of censors and in the midst of chaos, deportations, and destruction. We also look at the material nature of the letters we've curated and ask, how did survivors and relatives preserve or come to safeguard letters from the wartime period, and how did these seemingly ordinary objects transform into precious and extraordinary symbols of what was lost? And so tonight's panel fits extremely well into the exhibition's themes and questions. Now, before I introduce the chair of tonight's event, just uh, a few notes of housekeeping. You will be kept on mute throughout the entire program. Um, please enter any comments or questions in the chat at any time, and we will try to take up as many as we can after the formal presentations. We've enabled auto captioning, and you can turn this on and off at the bottom of your screen. Um, just please note that it is automated, so sometimes the uh, words of the speaker are not accurately uh, reflected um, in the captions. And finally, the event is being recorded for our YouTube channel, but your camera won't appear on screen. So now I'd like to introduce the moderator of tonight's panel, Professor Dan Stone, who is Professor of Modern History and Director of the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London and one of the partners of the HDRP initiative. He is the author or editor of 20 books and over 80 scholarly articles. His most recent book, The Holocaust and Unfinished History, was published by Pelican this year to great acclaim. So Dan, I'd like to hand the virtual floor over to you. Thank you, Christine, and uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks very much for joining tonight. I won't repeat what Christine said about the context or about the exhibition. Um, just urge people to uh, go and see it if you get the chance, if you're in London, um, because uh, this uh, this event, I think, fits very uh, nicely with um, the exhibition itself. So what we're going to do tonight is um, I will introduce the four speakers now, the two co-editors of the volume and two of the contributors, uh, and then uh, hand over to them. Uh, but I'd, I'd like first, if I may, just um, to read the first paragraph from the book, because for me, it's been a great pleasure uh, to see this book develop from its initial conception through to publication. And as Christine says, it, it really, it challenges many of the ideas that we have about the Nazi camps and about the context of uh, relief and uh, self-organization during the Holocaust and uh, calls, I think, many of our ideas about who was helping whom uh, into, into question two. So uh, I'd like to just start by reading uh, the first paragraph. Religious communities, philanthropic and state agencies, relatives, friends and strangers shipped a stream of relief aid to Jews 
trapped in Nazi-era camps and ghettos for most of World War II. Remittances of cash and shipments of medicine, clothing, and particularly food parcels played a critical role during the war in maintaining morale and prolonging life for Jews in all corners of the Nazi empire. Recent histories of wartime rescue have marginalized these relief efforts, instead focusing on a handful of activists who hid Jews or led them to safety under perilous conditions, or on the small pool of courageous individuals who worked to secure the release of camp prisoners and precious visas for refugees. These acts were indisputably important. Yet the parallel story of relief shipments is no less important. References to and requests for food parcels permeate wartime correspondence sent from inside Nazi detention sites. Typical was the March 1941 postcard that a Chicago family received from their relatives in the Warsaw Ghetto. We are healthy, but we have no means of support. Try to send bigger packages. Send us packages so that we can somehow survive. More Than Parcels brings together insights from a group of historians with wide ranging expertise on the Nazi era detention system and its victims, international humanitarian work and the Holocaust. Drawing on case studies from Europe and beyond, our volume maps out the broad array of parcel relief schemes organized by and for Jews during the Holocaust and assesses their impact. It details the aid efforts underwritten not only by the International Red Cross and major Jewish groups, but also by thousands upon thousands of individuals on both sides of the Atlantic and deep in the Soviet interior. So just from that, you get a sense of the, the novelty of the approach, the range of sources uh, that are used, uh, and uh, the scope of the volume. Obviously, we can't hear from all of the contributors, but there are chapters here on the War Refugee Board, on parcels being sent from France, uh, Danes uh, in Theresienstadt and uh, all sorts of different uh, settings uh, and I, I recommend the book uh, very warmly but tonight we're going to hear from uh, four of the contributors uh, first uh, Jan Lamberts uh, who is a historian and applied researcher at the Mandel Center of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum she has a PhD from Royal Holloway uh, and has published several studies of Jewish responses to persecution during the Nazi era She's currently completing a monograph about the problem of Jewish missing persons in the early post-war years. The next speaker will be uh, Pontus Rudberg, a historian and researcher at the Hugo Valentin Center at Uppsala University in Sweden. He's the author of The Swedish Jews and the Holocaust and co-editor of Early Holocaust Memory in Sweden, Archives, Testimonies, Reflections. He's currently researching rehabilitation aid for Holocaust survivors. The third speaker is uh, Katarzyna Persson, who's a historian of the Holocaust, working in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. She's published on the history of Jews in Poland during the Holocaust and in the immediate post-war period, and is the author of a number of books, including Warsaw Ghetto Police, the Jewish Order Service during the Nazi occupation, and just published and co-authored with Dieter Steinert, the, Pse the Przemysłowa concentration camp, the, the camp, the children, the trials. And finally, uh, the other co-editor of the volume, Jan Lanicek, uh, is Associate Professor in Modern European and Jewish History at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, in Australia. His recent books include Arnost Frischer and the Jewish Politics of Early 20th Century Europe, The Jew in Czech and Slovak Imagination, 1938 to 39, Antisemitism, the Holocaust and Zionism, and Czechs, Slovaks and the Jews, 1938 to 1948. He's currently completing a study of post-Holocaust reconciliation in Czechoslovakia, and working on a project that analyzes responses to the Holocaust in Australia. So with that, I'd like to hand over, first of all, to Jan. Um, thanks so much for your kind introduction, Christina and Dan. Um, I'm afraid I have to start with a legal disclaimer, which is I'm expressing my own opinions here and not necessarily those of the US Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum. Um, we're so pleased to have a chance to present some highlights from our book and also reflect on how it might intersect with the stories that are told in this exciting new exhibit, Holocaust Letters, here at the Wiener Library. Um, our book, More Than Parcels, which came out last summer with Wayne State University Press, um, actually began as a conversation between my co-editor, Jan Lanacek, and one of the other contributors, Gerald Steinacher, a historian who's written a lot about the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, we were gradually made aware of how many scholars were in fact working on the subject of food parcels um, that were sent to Jewish prisoners in Nazi camps and ghettos. And we were fortunate in getting um, several of them to contribute to this book and the whole project of mapping 
similar efforts that were made across the globe. Um, in the end, we came up with 11 different um, case studies and um, involved people from something like nine different countries. Um, I wanted to say a few words about the importance that this collective project has had for me sitting here in Washington, DC. Um, first, it explores further how information about Jewish persecution, including deportations and starvation conditions traveled during the war and how requests for food parcels or simply package receipts were understood and decoded by the people who received them. Um, so much like letters, they performed a kind of uh, tracing service for missing persons during the war. Second, our project opened one more door for understanding how porous or tightly sealed the walls of ghettos and diverse Nazi camps were, in what detention sites were packages and letters for that matter allowed, for how long and for which prisoners. The number of letters, postcards, remittances, and parcels that flowed into some of the larger ghettos in occupied Poland, for instance, as late as 1942, is simply astonishing. And this project has kind of helped unravel some of those questions that we have about um, things that were allowed and not allowed in the whole postal system. Um, finally, our project has given us some greater understanding of the really heated debates that occurred within many wartime Jewish organizations and communities and even families about what constituted res rescue. Was it worthwhile investing in even small gestures to extend the lives of Jewish prisoners, particularly when there were no guarantees that packages sent would actually be delivered rather than being pillaged or simply stolen by corrupt officials and guards along the way. So we've asked a couple of the contributors to briefly describe their chapters in More Than Parcels, but also perhaps to reflect on how the history of relief parcels intersects with the history of Holocaust letters and other forms of mail sent to Jews trapped in Europe. And we hope too that um, this important exhibit will spur all of you in the audience to pay closer attention to the letters of war and what could be communicated across great distances in times of censorship and in times of great peril. We also ask you to reflect not only on the letters and packages that got through, but also the mail that was not delivered or that was sometimes ominously returned to sender. Um, so thank you for the privilege of your time and for um, coming to this event today. And I'm turning over the floor now to Pontus Rudberg. Thank you, uh, Jan and, and Christine and, and Jan and Dan for <laughs> organizing, introducing and, and inviting uh, to this event. So my chapter in this volume is about Swedish Jewish efforts to send relief um, to Jews in Nazi controlled Europe. Um, it's about how Jews in neutral Sweden in different Jewish relief organizations in, in Stockholm and Gothenburg and Malmö in Sweden, through uh, correspondence, telephone calls, cables, uh, gathered information and, and compiled lists of names and addresses of Jews in ghettos and camps reported to, to still be alive. Uh, meanwhile, they corresponded with international Jewish organizations, uh, relief organizations um, around the world and with Jews in Nazi-controlled Europe about where it was possible to send packages of food and medicine and, and how to go about it in order for shipments to, to be allowed. At the same time, uh, they also raised funds through persuading individuals, companies, and, and other organizations to donate money. Uh, they published calls for donations in the press, especially in the Jewish press. And in the synagogue, um, the rabbi called upon the congregants to give. Uh, and they also organized contributions, fundraising dinners, um, the Jewish Musical Society in, in Stockholm gave concerts and 
and there were uh, fundraising bazaars and, and lotteries. But um, the, the relief committees in Sweden had one great obstacle, which was the, the Swedish export ban on food, which meant that the Swedish committees had to wire money and these addresses, lists of names and addresses to other countries, uh, mainly Portugal and Switzerland, but also to, to German firms in Germany so that they would send the food uh, from there to Jews in ghettos and later also into camps. And since there was, uh, uh, there was a better chance that the packages would be allowed through if the sender was a large non-Jewish relief organization, they also had to persuade such organizations to, to stand as the official sender of the packages. Uh, and also later to, to be able to deliver uh, packages to camps, uh, they had to persuade the Red Cross to, to deliver them. Um, in 1942, uh, it sometimes took around 14 days for a shipment uh, uh, of packages from Portugal to reach the recipients in, in uh, occupied Poland. But it could take much longer, and sometimes uh, the packages disappeared along the way. They got confiscated or, or stolen. And the packages were distributed by the, the Jewish relief organizations um, in Poland, the, the Jüdische Soziale Selbsthilfe and the Jüdische Unterstützungsstelle in Poland, uh, where they were monitored by the German Red Cross uh, um, there and by the German authorities. Um, the packages were sent in Poland to, to Warsaw, Krakow, Lublin, Lemberg, uh, and other places, um, and also to, to other corners of, of Nazi-controlled Europe. And they typically contained the Portuguese packages, sardines, coffee, cocoa, honey, and condensed milk. They could also contain jam, ovaltine, um, flour, sugar, and almonds. Individual packages were sent by relatives uh, and friends also in Sweden, in, uh, already in the 1930s uh, to Germany and throughout the Nazi period to, to different places. Um, independent shipments of clothes were also made. Uh, and there were shipping firms that specialized on different areas uh, that offered the Jewish organizations in Sweden their services. So there was one company that, that uh, delivered uh, food to Soviet uh, Jewish refugees in, in the Soviet Union, for instance. And the, the Jewish Committee in Stockholm also uh, financed a large, large shipment of typhus fever serum that was shipped from Mexico through Switzerland to Poland. Um, as the Polish ghettos were liquidated and its inhabitants deported, the Swedish Jews shifted their attentions to, to other places, uh, to orphanages and, and camps. Uh, in Theresienstadt, uh, the south of France, and, and later to Hungary, and, and to support the Jewish refugees in Shanghai as well. Uh, Jewish refugees in exile in Sweden also sent packages. The Danish branch of the Hechalutz, for instance, sent packages to the Danish Jews in Theresienstadt. And there was also an organization for exiled Polish Jews in Stockholm and so on. So these little groups of, of uh, exiled Jews were sending to their own uh, uh, relatives and, and communities. And the Swedish Jewish uh, uh, relief committees also tried to figure out to where the Jews of different ghettos uh, who had been deported, um, where they were sent and also elaborated on to what degree the deportees could be alive still. 
so we have in the archive of the Stockholm Jewish community, for instance, these, these memos where they speculate about the mortality rate in different destinations. Uh, and these estimations were partly based on reports that they received from diplomats and refugees and others who came to Sweden from, from Nazi-controlled Europe, and partly on their own uh, investigations, because they were making small shipments where the recipients had to sign a receipt in order to get their, uh, to get their letter or package. So from these receipts, they at least knew that someone was alive at, at that moment there. And um, in some cases, they also received letters with reports from Jewish representatives uh, in camps. So these reports give us an idea about what Jews outside of the, of the countries under Nazi control understood about what was happening in, in, uh, within the territories. Um, in August 1944, a group of activists connected to World Jewish Congress managed to persuade the, the Swedish state to allow uh, relief shipments, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of kilos of food to, to be shipped directly from Sweden to Jews in camps in, in Germany. And they, they managed to send some 80,000 food packages uh, before the end of the war to Theresienstadt, Bergen-Belsen and, and Ravensbrück and, and other camps. Um, these packages uh, normally contained one kilo of sugar, one half kilo of bread, uh, one half kilo of condensed milk, oil and, and herring. And um, I think one important consequence of, of the organization of, of the Swedish relief shipments was that it, it helped build up organizations and cooperations and networks that were also used for, for other forms of relief and rescue. Uh, it opened up channels between Jewish organizations and the government, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, the Red Cross and, and foreign diplomats and the different Jewish relief committees were also uh, engaged in, in this Swedish pest uh, in receiving the Danish Jewish refugees that fled to Sweden in, in no October and November 1943. And above all, in, in the Swedish Red Cross mission to evacuate survivors from, from concentration camps in the spring of 1945 and also in the reception and rehabilitation of, of survivors after the war. So uh, although the Swedish relief uh, was limited, uh, it was important. And, and we also have uh, survivor testimonies that say that, that the packages sent from Sweden were crucial for, for their survival. So that's, that's more or less what, what's in, in my chapter in, in this volume. Thank you. Thank you, Pontus. Uh, I think we'll hand over now to Kasia. Thank you. And uh, thank you for organizing this. And thank you for the wonderful volume, Jan and Jan. It was really wonderful to be part of it. I um, have a presentation because I have a story of people and I need, uh, here we go. And I need pictures for that. Second. Here we go. Okay. Uh, so my chapter is a micro history of uh, two families. And it begins with a story of uh, Jaina Halperson, also known as Janka. This uh, postal picture, when the story begins in uh, August 1939, she's 18 years old, just graduated from high school, and is going to Sweden for a one-month course learning Swedish for foreigners. And after that, she's meant to go to university. 
So she leaves her home in Warsaw in August and uh, her family is understandably very worried. So the first time that Janka's going abroad and her mother starts sending her letters. She sends her letters, sometimes two letters a day, making sure that she's keeping appropriate company, eating well, she's never cooked for herself, and constantly also sending her addresses of acquaintances who can help her should something go wrong. When the war breaks up on September 1st, 1939, Janka is still in Sweden and her family decides that she should stay there and wait for the situation to sort itself out. The second story is that of Haim Finkelstein, who's here on the left-hand side. And Haim is also from Warsaw. He's 40 years old and he's a well-known journalist and the director of a Hebrew publishing house. On August 23rd, 1939, he sets off to Switzerland to attend a Zionist Congress in Geneva. On 1st of September, he is on his way back. He's in Paris, unable to come back home. He decides to, to go to America and from there attempts to organize visas for his family, for his wife and two young daughters who are at that point in Warsaw. And soon after the war begins, both Janka and Haim began send, sending parcels home. Even though there are many uh, differences in the circumstances, material aid which they provided become one of the few sources of hope of survival for the extended families in Poland and those living in the Warsaw Ghetto. The distinct yet very linked, very much linked stories show how aid reached the Warsaw Ghetto from thousands of individual Jews abroad. As I'll show, mail both letters and parcels passed into and out of the Warsaw Ghetto at astonishing rate. Those letters remain invaluable in reconstructing social dynamics and emotional register of those caught up in the horrors of the Holocaust. But they also show us the importance of family links in such difficult times with ghetto inhabitants and Jewish refugees abroad sharing their meager and often rapidly dwindling resources with family members who they considered to be even worse off. Discussion uh, around material help, while crucial, found them the part of contents of letters exchanged by both members of the Finkelstein and Halperson families. Both those who were left behind and those who emigrated spoke above all of bygone family life and of longing, both for each other and for the often idealized past they shared. And due to censorship, both that imposed by the authorities and self-censorship of correspondence, not wishing to upset the loved ones, we learned very little about harsh realities of life in the ghetto, as well as the struggles of living as refugees. The only negative aspects of current life which people write about are homesickness and loneliness. On September 1st, 1940, a year after the family parted, Heim Filkenstein wrote to his wife in Warsaw, and I quote, I know that your life is difficult. I know that in every respect you have it worse than I do, but believe that I suffer a great deal as well. Over the horrible year of being apart, I went through various stages. I lived as if asleep. I often did not know what was happening to me. In a word, I was half unconscious. I went through sleepless nights, days when I could not swallow anything, when I traveled on the subway from one end of the city to another with no aim and no need, only because I could not find a place for myself. I lived on the memory of the last letter and hope for the next one. On December 14, 1941, he wrote to her, this is not normal life, only day-to-day -day vegetation. Nine days later, he added, you at least have our children next to you. And who do I have? Nobody's waiting for me at home. Nobody's worried about me. Nobody cares about me. And I don't care for anyone here. And I don't wait for anyone because from the first moment when I wake up in the morning, the last conscious moment before I fall asleep, I think only of you. I remember you and I'm thrilled with you. People constantly ask for news and express concern about each other's well being, suspecting, usually right, that their correspondents were trying to hide information about them. About, especially about the illnesses and other types of struggles. So Janka Halperson's parents, for example, focused much of the letters on her nephew, little Stefan, and describing in detail his development and sending his photographs. They very rarely, if ever, complained about their life, about the living condition, or mentioned in any way they needs. 
Still as the news of reality of life in the ghetto reached the refugees from other sources, they became increasingly proficient decoding the correspondent real situation. On March 16, 1941, Finkelstein addressed his wife directly. For God's sake, how do you support yourself? Do you think they just believe all your claims that you and the children look good and have clothes to wear? I know with complete certainty that you are not well and there is nobody to look after you, so how can you cope? It was finally from his wife's unsteady handwriting that Finkelstein deciphered that Rivka, his wife, was hiding a serious illness from him. And the same, on the other hand, refugees' letters also made no, ad, no admission of financial concerns and struggles, even though it was clear, and was of course clear to those in Warsaw, that in most cases, refugees had no resources or family networks to fall back on, no or only limited knowledge of local language, and were often financial, uh, uh, suffering extreme finan financial stress. So for example, Janka Halperson's parents were repeatedly bringing up her lack of adequate clothing, which was only meant to stay in Sweden for a month, her work, living conditions, and health. On December 23rd, 1940, her mother wrote that she, and this already after the, clo after the closure of the ghetto. So her mother wrote that she would give half of my life to be able to see you and see for myself how you live there, to see that you don't work with that. There's no doubt that the main theme in these letters is guilt. So families in the ghetto are expressing guilt for having to ask for help, and those abroad are feeling guilty because they're not being able to help more, and they're because they are in a safer space. At the same time, it's also clear that these attempts to aid family members gives, give them purpose, give them strength in daily struggles, and also help them overcome emotional difficulty of adjusting to life abroad. While Finkelstein wrote openly about his emotional state, he underlined in his letters that he was an exception and that other refugees, I quote, made up stories in their letters about their life here. As a result, the recipients of letters often fully conscious of the glossing over of difficulties attempted to read between the lines or ask others for information on the state of the family members. So for example, Finkelstein very often directly addressed his daughters with questions about the well-being of the mother, assuming that they were more likely than her to tell him the truth. On February 2nd, 1941, he asked his friends in the Warsaw Ghetto, and that's the quote you can see here. My dears, again and again, I ask you to write me the truth about my Rivka and my girls. Please write me the truth without communicating first with her about what you are to write. I know that she's dictating your letters to me. I have to know, after all, if she and the children are healthy, how they look and what they were. A few good months ago, she promised to send me a photograph, but she did not send it, and I suspect it's because they don't look well, very well. Letters reaching the Warsaw Ghetto show us the extent to which information was circulated among Jewish emigrants abroad. They found, formed networks piecing together news from each letter, received attempting to gain a fuller picture of life in the ghetto and the fate of Jews in Poland more generally. And it's clear that disseminating news from the ghetto, from the letters, also became an important foundation stone for uh, expatriate communities during the war. Both Heim Finkelstein and Janka immediately volunteered, and even against the family wishes, to send parcels. Although Finkelstein clearly initially struggled financially, he began sending parcels almost immediately after his arrival in the United States. Despite the protests, Hanka, Janka Halperson began sending her family small sums of money as early as February 1940, so six months after she arrived in Sweden. A month later, she began sending clothes for her newborn nephew, Stefan, and the large parcel for her parents' wedding anniversary. While her, her parents implored her to limit the help, her sister-in-law, in a letter from the end of March 1940, confirmed that the family actually very much needed it. She wrote that the clothing for the baby will be very useful as they can't afford to buy him an overcoat, and this way they can take him for a walk outside. A month later, in April 40, another cousin informed Janka that she should be sending parcels to her parents, and if she, as she wrote, if they accept them. In particular, tinned food, and from July 1940, she actually began doing so. Yet as late as April 1941, her parents still continuously implored her to stop sending them parcels. 
and instead spent her money on her own needs. It was only in March 1942 that her father openly wrote for the first time that her parcels were actually necessary for that survival. At that point, nobody in the family was employed and they were actually facing starvation. And the same belief because of the family dynamics, Rivka Finkelstein had much less issues with asking for help from her husband. Stay healthy, send parcels. She simply wrote at the end of her letter of March 9th, 1941. However, again, she very rarely dwelt on her economic and financial needs and the hardships of providing a loan for her two daughters. As we know, families which were led by single women were among the poorest in the ghetto. Importantly, despite differences between them, without parcels from abroad, both families, which were both middle class before the outbreak of the war, faced starvation in the ghetto. Family members outside Poland very quickly became their only lifeline. To quote the ghetto postman, Perez Opoczyński, a parcel being sent decided the fate of the family. It solved the question, life of death. As I said at the beginning, parcels became, and letters became an important source of hope for uh, the Warsaw ghetto. Yet, of course, hope was not enough. And even food parcels sent by Hanka Halberson and Heim Finkelstein could not save the families. The only survivor of Finkelstein's immediate family was his younger daughter who was sent outside the ghetto. Her, his older daughter and wife were murdered during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. His younger daughter later reunited with him in the United States where he lived until the age of 102. Janka lost all her family members. Her parents were murdered in Axon, uh, during the summer operation of summer of 1942. Her brother was shot on the street by a Jewish policeman. Her sister-in-law, the one who was asking her for clothing for the little nephew, together with the baby, got out of the ghetto, but then unable to secure any sort of help, returned to the ghetto where she committed suicide and poisoned the baby. Janka returned to Poland after the war, but then emigrated to Sweden in 1968, where she also died in 2019, close to the age of 100. The letter discussed in this paper gave us intimate, intimate glimpse of the last moment of the lives of two families, which despite physical distance remain very, clear, very clearly, very tightly knit. And importantly, this is really the last chapter in the life of these families as they were never reunited physically. Because they're a kind of micro narrative limited to feelings and intimate family life, such letters alone offer a very limited picture of life in the ghetto. As, as, as well as life in exile. They are above all a form of self-presentation. -present we cannot learn the truth about forced migration or the full scale of horrors of ghetto life from them. They do, however, very clearly advance our understanding of family relations and history of emotions during the Holocaust. They also provide very importantly a, a unique source for history of women in the Holocaust, showing how women narrated changing family dynamics and shift in gender roles. Finally, they offer a unique source for linking micro and macro history of the Holocaust. They show us links between Jews across the entire globe, sometimes on what we would consider to be margins of the Holocaust, who are also affected by Nazi policy. So they take us one step closer to understanding the extremely multifaceted Jewish experience of the Holocaust and its long reach. Thank you. Thank you, Kasia. And finally, we'll hand over to Jan. OK, hello and uh, good morning um, to Australia. I will also use uh, use presentation. Not that I have a story um, to hide my face uh, early morning and uh, show some some images. Uh, so I hope, sorry. Okay, cool. Uh, so it's always advantage and uh, disadvantage to be to be the last one, uh, and uh, because I don't want to repeat what my colleagues have already said, and also uh, want to leave some time for for questions, but also I can comment on uh, at some concluding comments on on the presentations, and uh, in in fact uh, I'm I'm really glad that uh, Kasha and Pontus uh, join us today, uh, Jen. Uh, because it, their presentation and their chapters show how uh, diverse and comprehensive the volume actually is. 
that uh, on the one hand we have this micro history story of uh, of Warsaw and incredibly difficult to to uh, research and to reach any broader conclusions because we don't have so many uh, preserved collections as the Finkelstein so on the letters this I would say is rather an exception and then on the other hand uh, from Pontus so this kind of more a higher level of politics of diplomatic uh, diplomatic history and uh, efforts of the Jewish associations, organizations uh, to negotiate with the uh, various uh, governments, the options or opportunities to send uh, parcels. And I would say that the strength of the volume is that it just, it's so diverse and uh, it offers such diverse approaches. And also my chapter about which I shall talk about very briefly, uh, tries to do both uh, and uh, of a bit of micro history, but also uh, interaction between individuals and and the state. And uh, for me personally, the project originated when I did research on completely unrelated uh, topics of uh, allied responses to the Holocaust. But during the research over years, on numerous occasions, I came across references to uh, food parcels being sent from mostly from Portugal, from Lisbon, but also from Switzerland, Sweden, Turkey, uh, to Jewish ghettos and uh, concentration camps uh, under Nazi rule. And it really caught my attention in the way that uh, we can hear a lot about uh, rescue, physical rescue attempts, um, successful or unsuccessful during the war, uh, and much less about these efforts to uh, prolong the life of people who actually were staying uh, in Nazi Europe. And obviously, it's much more difficult uh, to kind of reach any satisfactory conclusion in this context, because we can't say how many people were, were saved by those parcels. We don't even know how many of them arrived in Europe during the war. Uh, so, and uh, we kind of, of course, can also claim that just the parcel itself, or 10 of parcels, could save individuals from, from death. Um, as Kasia mentioned in Warsaw Ghetto, it could prolong life, but once uh, the great action, the deportation of Treblinka started, uh, food parcels won't save you from uh, the deportation, uh, just an example. Uh, but what was actually quite surprising for me, uh, that uh, these parcels uh, when being sent uh, and being received, not only in some of the most famous, notorious um, ghettos, uh, which were used for propaganda, uh, by the Nazis, such as the Residenstadt, or by some well-known personalities, such as Rabbi Leo Beck in the Residenstadt, uh, but that these, uh, uh, from Prague, this is kind of a parcel wrapping from Portugal, uh, as uh, Pontus mentioned, some of the organizations that were sending parcels uh, from Portugal was mostly uh, the uh, gremium, gremium of the uh, exporters of uh, cans of sardines or uh, fish cans, which was uh, kind of the organization that was physically sending them, but uh, they were paid for by Czech, Jewish, or Polish Jewish uh, associations. But that such parcels are being sent also to Warsaw Ghetto, to, uh, to Krakow, uh, to, uh, to Lodz, and also to uh, places where we would not really expect parcels to be uh, sent, such as uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, the death camp in uh, in occupied uh, Poland. And not only that we know that such parcels were being sent to Auschwitz, we even know that some of them were delivered, although I need to emphasize very strongly at, the, at this point that we are talking about uh, only very minor, minor, minor part of the parcels who were being uh, distributed even to Jewish prisoners uh, in Auschwitz. Let's not make an impression that uh, all Jewish prisoners in Auschwitz were receiving sardines, uh, uh, cans with sardines from Portugal, but we know that some of them were, which obviously raises more questions for us as historians to actually uh, try to figure out what was uh, what was happening uh, in this uh, in this case. And I would say uh, that uh, you already got it from uh, Kasia's presentation that the amount of the number of parcels being sent throughout the war in Europe or from outside of Europe into Europe is uh, was enormous. We are talking about hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, of parcels. Um, from individuals, which very difficult to uh, trace or to research, but also from, um, let's actually, sorry, I just wanted to show, I, I found this once on the internet, so I probably shouldn't use it, but uh, it's a, it is a can of sardines from Auschwitz, which kind of 
is supposed to confirm my theory, but because I don't know the background, I, I shouldn't talk about it. But this apparently does exist in the, uh, uh, from Auschwitz. Anyway, uh, but um, also from organizations, uh, most of them um, with the Jewish uh, uh, funding, such as the Jewish uh, distribution, joined the Jewish distribution committee uh, in Lisbon and uh, the head of, uh, of this uh, executive of the European division, uh, Joseph uh, Schwartz, uh, who was very much involved in sending uh, these parcels uh, into Europe, but also uh, from uh, governmental agencies, as Dan mentioned, the World Refugee Board and also uh, a Czech or Polish governments uh, were, uh, were involved. Uh, in my case, in my chapter, I was actually trying to focus on uh, these activities in, um, in uh, um, allied countries uh, among Jewish refugees and exiled governments and their efforts to, uh, to send parcels to, uh, to Europe. And I have three main questions uh, in the last four minutes I have today I want to mention that I do research in the chapter. The first one is what was actually known uh, outside of the Nazi Europe uh, about the situation. And thanks to Kasia and her presentation, we know that uh, quite a bit was known from many diverse sources about what was happening, especially in the first uh, half of the war until 1941. Uh, and the United States uh, joined the war, and uh, the connection, postal connection, no longer uh, existed. But the amount of information that traveled uh, from individuals, uh, from journalists, from from people who managed to escape from Europe, uh, still in the first half of the war, uh, was quite uh, enormous in the amount of information depicting the levels of starvation and deprivation in the ghettos. So, especially about the first half of the war, about the first stages of persecution, there was sufficient amount of information available uh, in the uh, in the allied countries, uh, even books were published on this on this uh, topic. Uh, a lot of information also was available in the allied uh, press about the starvation in the ghettos. Then the question which I asked uh, once the information was available, uh, what was the response? And uh, we know that um, there were efforts by many Jewish organizations, as, uh, as Pontus mentioned, by individual Jewish refugees uh, to negotiate uh, shipments of uh, food to these ghettos uh, with the hope that they would help their family members, their communities. However, the main issue was that from the perspective of the Allies, uh, and after the US entered the, the war fully, uh, was that uh, any shipment of food uh, was prohibited to Europe because of the blockade and the belief that uh, the, the economic deprivation or the uh, economic crisis they could bring to uh, Germany, it could help to end the war uh, quicker. So it took more than a year uh, and long negotiations uh, from the Jewish organizations and their supporters to persuade the British and Americans to allow some first minor concessions and allowed shipments of a uh, small number amount of uh, parcels to these ghettos of occupied Europe at the point when most of these ghettos had already been uh, liquidated or most of the prisoners had already killed. And the British made it clear from the very beginning that this is only a minor concession that is not to challenge the existence of the blockade, uh, is not to challenge the effort to uh, kind of economic warfare against, against Germany. And even in late night, in July 1944, the British government uh, clearly said that uh, it is a small, small program and that the most of those who are uh, in the camps and get those will have to uh, wait with patience and bravery for the day of uh, liberation. Uh, so the final question I was trying to ask was uh, how many parcels were sent from the, uh, uh, by the Allied uh, kind of organizations from neutral countries and uh, to which destinations and how many, if possible, uh, we can tell how many were delivered. So this is just a basic map, which I, I created myself. And um, the green dots uh, are the places from where uh, parcels are being sent. So from Lisbon, from Geneva, from, from uh, Zurich, um, uh, from, uh, from Istanbul, and then as Pontus mentioned, from Sweden. And the red uh, dots are those places where, at least in the programs that I researched, uh, they were uh, sent to. So the largest one in Theresienstadt ghetto, but also uh, camps uh, and ghettos in Poland and, uh, and other 
other places. Uh, we don't know how many par parcels in total were sent uh, in the programs. We know even less about how many were uh, delivered. Uh, and uh, we know that, uh, for example, the Theresia that several uh, hundreds of thousands were sent and possibly quite a significant number was delivered because of the propaganda uh, role that the residents that played in Nazi, Nazi um, uh, kind of propaganda campaigns, much less we know about the uh, other camps. Final comment uh, to allow some uh, play, uh, space for, for discussion. Uh, it's important to research, as, as Kasia uh, mentioned already, uh, the kind of uh, uh, impact of these parcels uh, on the uh, recipients not only in terms of food, but also psychological or moral or mental support, but also the impact on the senders, uh, because they clearly, this allowed them opportunity to do something from the depression of not being able to help, from the separation, uh, from this kind of uh, feeling of uh, inability to, to help and support from the relative safety of, of allies or neutral countries, something which we also try to cover uh, in the uh, in the volume, and I will, I will, I will stop here uh, to allow time for for, for discussion. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues, um, for your wonderful presentations. I think it's what we've heard gives an a sense of the scope of the book in terms of the geographical scope and the institutional coverage. But what I think is really important, and I would say, uh, what recommends this book so highly beyond the narrow confines of, of Holocaust studies is this is one of the best adverts for the historical profession that I've read in a long time. The, the, uh, the detailed research, difficult research that has gone into this book is really remarkable. And um, I think in the absence of, I, I don't see any questions yet in, in the chat, apart from one about the exhibition, which we can, we can come to uh, in a bit. I, I wonder if any of you would like to say something about sources and about how you went about researching these uh, these chapters because i think that it it's clear that parcels and aid packages were sent in huge numbers but as we know from postal history in general this stuff tends to become ephemera and so things like the receipts that that jan was just showing are easily destroyed um you know how how do you actually go about researching these these issues this is for anyone who wants to, maybe Jan, if you want to, to answer. Um, I, I don't have a really specific answer for you, but I think um, since working on this project, I'm much more conscious of um, the, what's in Holocaust correspondence or Holocaust era correspondence and they, the request for food is really ubiquitous. And I think I didn't notice that before. And now it's in virtually every letter that I see crossing borders. And so, so I, I think that's really changed how I read all of these. And um, I, I think the contributions by people like Pontus and Kasha have also made me think about what the letters mean both for recipients and senders. And, and as I said at the beginning, and also what it means to have a letter returned in that ominous way as undeliverable. So I hope um, there's some references to that in the exhibition, which I look forward to seeing. Thanks, Jan. Uh, Pontus or Kasha, do you want to say anything? I will say that what definitely changed for me is that you start looking for silences as well. When reading letters from the Holocaust, you automatically look for what's not there, as opposed to only, uh, only was there. And that it actually happens on both sides. So it's not just the silences from those uh, letters coming out of the ghetto, but also in those coming from uh, from the communities abroad. Antos, do you want to add anything? Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I I was lucky to to work in a small country and with small small organizations and and Jewish communities because yeah it's the scope is limited so I can you know uh, read all of the letters and and the reports and and um, so that made it easier although it's a lot of correspondence to go through but um, yeah that that made it possible. Mm -hmm. But it's so fascinating to, to me 
that we have you know these these things have been sitting in the archives for decades but the questions of course that, that historians ask about the sources change over time and suddenly this interest in in letters um, is becoming very widespread and and what you've done with this book I think is really exemplary and, and sets the bar pretty high for for other scholars um Pontus there's another question for you here in the chat um Rosa is asking you if you could say a little more about Hungary yeah when it comes to um to material uh aid um the the Jewish community in in Stockholm sent um while uh, the the Swedish legation, the the, the Swedish diplomats uh, tried to to save Jews in Hungary, uh, the the Swedish Jews sent them lists of names, and uh, they also uh, received requests for aid to to orphanages in in Budapest in forty four and for um, and later also for er elderly Jews in in Budapest. So. They sent food packages there and uh, and also agreed to to help them uh, to come to Sweden, but uh, they didn't get um, permission to leave in the end. But uh, they arranged visas for for these children and and elderly people. But yeah, that's um, thank you. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Rosie. Did Hechalutz in Sweden send parcels? Uh, I assume that means to the concentration camp. There's, I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. I, no, I don't think uh, on a small scale, perhaps, but through the larger uh, relief committees in, in Sweden. But the Danish he Hechalutz in exile in Sweden, their members sent packages to uh, the Danish Jews in Theresienstadt. Um, mm hmm like like the other sort of exile uh, refugee organizations, they they sent to their group sort of in different places. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say with with uh, I think they they send a lot from Switzerland actually. Uh, from uh, the uh, my knowledge I have about that that Hechaluz uh, was quite strong in Switzerland around uh, Nathan Schwalb, and they were sending to to Warsaw as well, I believe, uh, in the first half of the war and. Um, to, to members of the Hechalus uh, in occupied Poland. So that's another a possibility for research. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Sarah. I'm curious if letters and packages held by censors during the war were forwarded onward when censorship or war ended. For example, Shanghai's Jewish refugees were not able to send or receive anything between spring 1942 and June 1945. So I wonder if letters were sent or they were all returned. Or did they end up in in dead mail in post offices or elsewhere? If anyone wants to <laughs> try that one, I, I wouldn't know. I'm sorry to say. I don't know either. But I think, well, realistically, there was nobody to forward those letters to after the war because almost everybody was murdered. So in that sense, um, but I don't know. They most like destroyed like Sarah that's one for you to to look into I think um and there's a question here from uh, Catherine are there comparable micro histories on parcels sent from Austria to Theresienstadt I don't know if anyone knows the answer um I guess I just want to comment generally there are a lot of case studies that we actually didn't manage to cover um, but um, we hope that this would be a kind of stimulus for people to take up this topic in, in other contexts. I also wanted to come back briefly to the question you started with, Dan, um, about, about sources. And I think um, Kasia's, Kasia's presentation reminded me that I think not only are we reading letters differently, but we're also scrutinizing them in new ways because, in fact, I think in her in her chapter she talks about the deteriorating handwriting of some of the correspondents being a kind of signal that their health was also deteriorating and and so I think it's really important to look at the original correspondence and not just transcripts of it to see what the material the writing material was like 
um, and, and what kind of clues it gave recipients to, or, or historians now for that matter, to decode what was actually possibly playing out. Yes, I, I completely agree. And, and the, that material aspect of the, the letters is something that is stressed in the exhibition, actually. So um, there's there's quite a lot of analysis of, of the, the letters as objects um, and the marks on them, the, the, the stamps, the handwriting uh, and so on. So you can, the drawings, uh, marginalia, there's quite a lot that one can glean from um, paying close attention to uh, the, the, the sources in, in their original uh, form and not just as transcripts of, of content. Um, Christine, do we have time for one one final question? This question here, uh, Alan is asking if if you've worked with philatelic specialists in this field. Um, I, I I just glanced at the Holocaust Museum's um, library holdings on on books that had been published on um, postal history of the war, and there are quite a few. And I would say that was definitely a starting point. There were a number of philatelic collectors who looked at what kind of mail came out of um, concentration camps in particular. Um, most recently, there was a huge um, book published by Heinz Weber, uh, mm -hmm. a German journalist who unfortunately passed recently. And um, it, it was certainly, I think, the starting point for we're thinking about camp mail and continues to be a, a, a useful resource for analyzing what was possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, and actually I, I should say here that the, the book by Veva and, and many others, for anyone who's interested, uh, is included in the bibliography for the Holocaust letters. Oh, thank you. Uh, Christine's just posted it. Uh, I was going to say that the bibliography to the letters exhibition is online and, and includes many of those um, specialist studies in um, the history of of the post. So, uh, for anyone who's interested, there's the there's the link. Uh, I, I think it's time to to wrap up. So, um, I'd like to thank my colleagues for uh, giving us uh, an insight into into this wonderful book. Oh, sorry, it's blurred on my screen, but uh, anyway, you can you can follow the link. Uh, I urge everyone to read it. It's a really it's a really fabulous book. And uh, thank you everybody for for joining us. And I'll just hand back to Christine to close. Sorry, I had to find myself and put myself in the picture. Um, it just rains for me to thank all of our panelists and, of course, um, everybody for joining us this evening. And, of course, thank you for, I just re reiterate what Dan said, thank you for your work on this volume and um, all of your contributions to this uh, significant history. So thank you again and good night and good morning, good day to Jan. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.